This is a world map scaled to the amount of population in each region. This is a world map scaled to the amount of research output in each region. As you can see, the two maps are a little different. In particular, areas uh, that I'll characterize as the global south, that's uh, Africa, South Asia, uh, the um, uh, Southeast Islands, and South America um, are uh, a bit underrepresented relative to the global population. This is um, uh, the problem is even worse if you consider just the behavioral sciences rather than science at large. For example, there's um, an audit of uh, top psychology journals that finds that less than 1% of all research samples and first authors are African. I think the, the risks in behavioral science of this skew, this under um, lack of representation are particularly severe in the behavioral sciences because the people who come up with the ideas of behavioral science um, do so on the basis of their experiences. And if uh, most of the people who are doing behavioral science happen to be located in the global north, they'll happen to research the topics that are relevant to the global north and not the ones that are relevant to the global south. In addition, if you're doing research on participants who are from a particular world region, the kinds of things that you'll um, discover will tend to be the kinds of things that are relevant to those populations. And insofar as uh, things like public policy are based on the findings of behavioral science, the, those policies that we develop on the basis of uh, Global North findings by Global North researchers will be especially relevant to the Global North and less so to the Global South, resulting in a risk of waste resources or even unintended harms. These facts form the backdrop of this talk. Uh, and in particular, um, over the past, um, I'd say, uh, five years or so, I've become especially interested in the issue of representation um, in the, of the Global South and the behavioral sciences. And um, I've spent quite a bit of time working in organizations that um, have as part of their mission uh, trying to address this issue. These two organizations are um, the Psychological Science Accelerator and the, my current workplace, the Pissarra Center for Behavioral Economics. The Psychological Science Accelerator is um, a, a big team organization that does highly collaborative projects that are almost always international in scope um, to accomplish together um, uh, scales of projects that could not be accomplished by any one lab on their own. And usually there's a, a cultural element to these projects. Um, so the idea might be to investigate, for example, the generalizability, um, global generalizability of a particular model of how people perceive faces. The Busara Center is um, headquartered in, in Nairobi and has its, its mission, um, the alleviation of poverty or doing behavioral science in service of the alleviation of poverty. And a big part of that mission involves some um, uh, research capacity. So ensuring that uh, there are tools, techniques, methods that are relevant to the global south and promoting their spread. So um, the issue of representation is very core to uh, its mission. I'm going to cover um, two case studies, um, one for each of these two organizations, and uh, examine this, this issue of uh, why research is so skewed to the uh, the needs and uh, interests of people in the global north. And um, I'm going to argue that core to this problem, core to the, the source of this problem, is the issue of research capacity, and specifically that uh, disproportionate research stems from disproportionate research capacity, where research capacity is greater in the global north. And um, a key reason for this disproportionate research capacity is the funding landscape. And in particular, I'm going to argue that the current funding landscape severely undervalues the funding and promotion of research capacity, especially in the global south. 
And um, finally, I'm going to point to what I view as uh, some severe problems with the current funding landscape. I will argue that it is wasteful, inequitable, and creates some uh, vulnerabilities in organizations like the Psychological Science Accelerator and the Pissarra Center for Behavioral Economics, and that these uh, vulnerabilities lead to uh, ethical pitfalls in the conduct of research. So this is gonna be a bit of an opinionated talk. Let me flag that up front. Um, there, I'm going to be expressing opinions that I developed through my experiences. And I'm gonna to try to walk you through the journey of how I came to form these opinions. In the first section of the talk, I will describe well, an opinionated view of the funding landscape. Um, in the second part, I'll um, describe my first case study, which is the Psychological Science Accelerator. In the third, I'll um, describe uh, the second case study, which is the Pissarra Center. And at the end, I'll try to wrap up uh, the discussion with um, some conclusions and opinions about um, what might help fix the funding landscape. The first point that I want to make about the funding landscape is that, uh, well, we have a pretty costly system in place. Um, we've enormous, we've invested enormous resources in choosing what to fund. And um, uh, we're trying to make sure, uh, hopefully that those invested resources actually do something. They result in uh, funding research that is quality in some sense, and that results in a good scientific payoff. To give you a sense of the, the scale of the resources invested, um, I'll draw on two papers. Um, there are others out there. Um, the first is this one, which um, just tracks in the US uh, the amount of time that uh, science and engineering faculty spent on preparing grant applications to do this selection of research. And they find that um, the average faculty spends about 10% of their time per week preparing grant applications, so about four hours per week. Just to emphasize, this is an enormous event, investment of time. Um, spread across uh, the faculty in the United States, if all the faculty are spending 10% of their time just preparing applications for saying that they should, um, that their project is worthy and worthy of investment by funding bodies, that's just, that's very costly. Um, there's another uh, study out of Australia. Um, so this one tracks the amount of time that faculty invested just applying to one call. And if you add all of that, um, of that time investment uh, up, it amounts to about 550 years of research time, which if you uh, do the multiplication by salary, um, that amounts to uh, an investment of 68 million USD, just devoted to selecting the, the money that, um, or the research that is going to be funded. Remember, this is not the, the money itself. This is just the process used to select what's going to get the money. So with that in mind, the fact that this is a very costly system, um, maybe we can uh, think about what it is that funders themselves say that they're trying to fund. So what are they looking for when they do the selection process um, that makes this decision about what it is that they should fund? Uh, well, if you look at um, just the text of calls for scientific funders, th these are the kinds of things that you see, and this is actual ta text taken from funder websites. Um, so one theme that emerges is that many funders uh, want uh, uh, excellent principal investigators, typically solo prin principal investigators. So for example, the European Research Council, which is um, probably the main scientific funder in Europe, says that they want talented early career scientists for their year, their starting grants, um, who has already produced excellent supervised work and is ready to work independently. So a couple themes, um, they want independence, they want some um, evidence of excellence. Uh, and in particular, they, they want people to have shown that they're already excellent. And once you've shown that you're excellent, um, the European Research Council says that they'll spend some money on you. Um, so independence, uh, solo, so they want individual people and an established track, track record of excellence. 
Another theme that emerges is that funders like specific projects. So this text is taken from um, one of the main granting mechanisms in the United States. Um, so the, uh, the R01, uh, this is administered by the National Institutes of, Institutes of Health, and they say that they want discrete projects that are specific, circumscribed, performed by a particular investigator, and they make some allowance for um, uh, multiple investigators in an area that uh, represents the investigator's specific interest and competencies. So they want people who uh, have already established that they can do the thing that they say they want to do, and they want something that's discrete, um, a particular project that will then generate discoveries that can be useful for um, the remit of the National Institute, Institutes of Health. Um, this particular category is not quite as common as the previous two, but a third theme that funders say that they want is um, people to solve specific projects or specific problems in a particular topic area. So um, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a funder called the Lacuna Fund. Um, the Lacuna Fund is set up to produce new labeled data sets that address a specific underserved population or problem. So a, a theme with the, these sort of problem solving oriented grants is that the funder identifies the priority. They write um, some text to say what they think their priority is. And then they solicit proposals for people to do projects that solve a particular problem that is set out by the funder. So, okay, we found three themes. One is excellent people. A second is specific projects that are within the funder's remit. And the third is uh, solving specific problems that are identified by the funder. So I'm gonna come back to some of those themes in the two case studies and try to connect um, those uh, specific types of funding to uh, the operations of the organizations that I have experience in. So the first study is um, about the Psychological Science Accelerator. And I already mentioned that uh, the BSA is um, doing these big team-based projects. Um, so you, you can think of it as a, a research network um, of people who, uh, when they join, they're saying in principle that they'd like to collaborate on a big team-based project that is often international in scope and has you know, some explicit goals focused around um, representing people across the globe, not just in the United States and Europe, um, both in terms of uh, uh, the people who join the project and the samples that they recruit. To give you a sense of the scale of these projects, I mean, these can be really quite large. Um, so this is uh, uh, some text, the abstract from the PSA's first empirical project. Um, this project represented participants from 11 world regions, 41 countries, and the uh, total project data set uh, was about uh, a bit more than 11,000 participants. Um, this is one example. Uh, one of our more recent projects um, had about, um, I think uh, the final number was over 500 uh, researchers, and the analytic data set was something on the order of 20,000. Um, so again, these can be really quite large, um, and the role of the PSA is to serve as sort of a, a coordinator, maybe, um, to make sure that these projects get done. Um, another important note about these projects is that um, uh, the PSA at least aspires to choose them somewhat democratically. Um, so this is some text from uh, the selection process. Um, the PSA operates maybe a little bit like a, a granting agency in some ways, in that um, it uh, sends out a call for proposals. Many calls are open-ended, so people can um, submit projects uh, in any topic area in principle. Um, there's an assessment process, and the PSA tries to assess projects at this stage um, just based solely on merit. Uh, and then there's a, a voting process where the PSA, um, PSA members vote on the projects that they like best. 
in um, a combination of these criteria, both uh, you know just based on scientific merits and based on the preferences of the people who join the PSA, um, informs the selection decisions. The important aspect um, to take away here is that there is a process to select projects democratically, and the projects uh, at least aspire to represent the broad interests of anybody who joins the PSA. Uh, and another important note about the PSA is that the, its goals are quite lofty. And I've, I've mentioned um, some of the PSA's values already. Um, for example, I, I mentioned that um, the PSA strives to be uh, internationally diverse. It also strives to um, have high quality research and it strives to be democratic, um, representing the interests of a variety of different people. Um, these are the specific values that the PSA sets out for it itself, and they're all lofty and good things. So diversity and inclusion is one of the primary ones. Um, also scientific rigor, uh, democratic decision making, which is something I've already mentioned. Uh, openness to criticism, transparency. These are all good things and good things that I personally would like to see in science that I do. Okay, so I mentioned that the projects are broad in scope, uh, very large, that there's some um, this democratic selection process, and that the PSA has very lofty values for how it does its research and what kind of research it should be doing. How does all this get done? Here's where um, the, the rubber hits the road a little bit. Um, so uh, the PSA, um, as of yet, has no core funding. Um, it, um, uh, there are some funding prospects, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, but um, right now, the, the way that the PSA does its work mostly is through volunteerism. Um, so this is, a, is an example of uh, a funding application that the PSA put out um, uh, early in its lifespan. And um, one of the major critiques was that while people are already doing the work, so why is it worth uh, funding the PSA in the first place? Um, I, I wanna point out here, just to connect this explicitly to the funding landscape that I mentioned before, what the PSA is doing is a bit of an awkward fit with the way that funding is structured right now. So for one thing, uh, there's this principle of democratic selection of projects. That does not fit well with the emphasis on funding specific projects that um, is quite common in the funding landscape. Another example of this awkward fit is uh, just the fact that the PSA is trying to be collaborative just by nature. So it's doing these big collaborative projects um, that require the multiple hands to get done. And that really doesn't fit well with an emphasis on solo PIs who are working independently. Um, and the PSA is not really set up to solve specific pro problems that are dictated by funders because, well, as I mentioned, the PSA is trying to select things, projects democratically to reflect the interest of, interests of many people. So in some sense, I think it's not a surprise that the PSA like, has had comments like this and in fact um, has uh, struggled a bit to, to achieve funding because what it's trying to do just doesn't fit well with the way that the funding landscape is structured. Okay, so mostly thus far, the PSA has um, run on volunteerism. It hasn't fallen apart entirely. In fact, it's um, the PSA has accomplished a lot and continues to accomplish a lot. How does it get that done? Like, what, what does it look like when uh, you're recruiting volunteers to work on PSA projects? Um, well, one way to understand this is just to look at a map of where volunteers are located. And you'll see that a lot of volunteers are located in Europe. Um, that's where the biggest concentration are. That's where these green dots are in the United States. And if you tally them all up, you'll find that um, two thirds, more than two thirds are located from regions that I broadly characterize as the global north. Um, and, um, you know, this is being generous with that categorization as well. Um, 
I think that's not necessarily surprising if you think about who has the ability to volunteer for BSA projects. Um, there are people with uh, pre-existing resources and resources are concentrated mostly in the global north. So the people, if you're relying on volunteers and you're putting out a call for volunteers, you're going to be selecting among people who are able to carve out the time um, because they have generous funding to donate time to uh, a law, an organization with lofty goals. The, the way that um, Charlie framed this in, in this tweet is that, um, you know, if you're drawing on people who, um, uh, who can volunteer their time, um, you're also probably going to set up a system that is uh, a bit unfair. So either you're going to draw on people who have uh, secure career status and just have the ability to do things that they want, or you're going to be drawing on people who are funded, but maybe early on in their career and just kind of want to change the way things are. And uh, that's true of the BSA. And even if those people have like dedicated funding, so maybe they're uh, funded on a grant and that frees up a lot of their time to work on uh, big lofty organizations or projects. Um, well, if you're relying on those people, they're doing things that are not recognized within the current system, that's a bit of a, a tough model. It's it's a bit unfair on those people. So I think there's an ethical dimension to um, the reliance, the BSA's reliance on volunteer labor. Another way to think about this is that some roles within the BSA are much easier to volunteer for than others. Um, so I, I've identified one of them. Um, this is the project monitor, or you know, basically it's a project manager. It's someone who coordinates a, um, these big teams for specific projects and ensures that people are not working on across purposes and are following a um, well-defined timeline. I, I think this is one of the most important roles for a PSA project because you know these are big. Um, team-based projects, and one of the things that becomes quite hard in a big team is coordination. Um, to give you a sense of what a project monitor does, just specifically, um, so project monitor, as I mentioned, they coordinate uh, between to maybe like 50 or even up to 400 team members. That's a lot of coordination. They also sit in on meetings um, to keep people updated. A, a lot of meetings, that's part of the coordination. Um, they assist with the strategy for implementing the study. And these are logistically quite complicated projects. They ensure that project materials are documented on, in an appropriate repository. Um, and that includes uh, IRB materials, for example. Um, they ensure that project team members are pro properly credited for what they're doing. Um, which is very key to the model that the PSA relies upon. Um, they keep the project on, on schedule. This is a, a lot of stuff and some of these tasks are quite complicated. Under the current model, what a project monitor gets is skills. Um, so that's not nothing. In fact, um, I think for me, it was um, it set me on a particular career path. Um, that uh, is very satisfying to me. And it, it's because I gained those skills as you know, doing some of this coordination. Um, you also get connections, which again is not nothing. So the PSA has 1200 plus members from all over the globe and you get to interact with uh, a lot of those people. And uh, I can say personally, you know, I, I gained a lot of satisfaction and concrete career benefits from being connected to a large network. And finally, you get place maybe number four on a 50 plus author paper. Um, this is a bit of a harder sell maybe. Under the current system, of course, of, of academic credit, um, the first author gets the lion's share of the credit. Um, there are maybe ways to work around this, but you know, you're working with the, within the system that we have. And this is not a great career incentive, I think. So to me, if you're not, putting money in this equation. If this is a volunteer um, role, this is a tough role to do strictly on a volunteer basis. 
I think the cost benefits, you know, it's, I don't see the scales as completely balanced. Another um, implication of the volunteer model of relying on strictly volunteer labor and not on money um, is that the lack of funds puts uh, constraints on the what the an organization like the PSA can do. And I don't think these constraints are entirely um, clear to someone who you know, doesn't work on budgets all the time. Um, uh, I think uh, academics are often hidden um, or they, they're protected from some of the financial aspects of what they do. Um, but the constraints become clearer when your, your role is to think about those um, where the money is coming from. And it was for me, I was the funding lead for this organization. So to make this clear, um, I think there are multiple um, versions of what the PSA can be. There's one version, which I call sort of the minimalist version of the PSA. And there's another version, which I, I you can think of as the sort of maximalist version. Um, the most minimal version of the PSA is that it can be just a mailing list of people where you can, individual people can, you know, once they've devised a project that they think could be a cool team-based project, they could use, um, they can mail out uh, a call for collaborators and um, the PSA could just be like a connector, a place where you find people who are willing to work on team-based projects. The more maximal version is that the PSA is actually implementing uh, these team-based projects. So it's more active. Uh, the minimalist version is not very costly at all. All you need is to set up some sort of mailing list group and let people go to it. Um, you don't even necessarily need to have any moderation. You can just let people use the mailing list as they wish. Um, that's uh, pretty achievable on very minimal resources. However, if the, if the PSA is being more active, it's doing more of the implementation, it's ensuring um, a certain standard of rigor, um, that takes resources. That's, that's going to be more costly. That's going to take more time and, and money and so forth. So you can see, based on how much money you have, you can either implement um, the minimal version uh, or the maximal version. And if your budget is restrained, if you don't have access to much resources, that constrains what the PSA can be, the, the loftiness of its ambitions. I would say that based on the, the values that the PSA espouses, you know, diversity and inclusion, rigor, democratic and decision-making, transparency and openness to criticism, it wants to be a more maximalist version of itself. Um, and I think that's clear when you sort of flesh out what it would take to live up to the, the, the values that the PSA espouses. So for example, um, the PSA could specifically choose to actively recruit leadership from outside of the North America and Europe. Well, if the PSA is doing that, like it, someone needs to do that recruitment. Someone needs to select the personnel. Someone needs to make sure that um, the, the broader vision of the, the leaders is consistent with the, the vision of the PSA itself. Um, the PSA could also to uh, encourage uh, more active participation from people in uh, low and middle income, country, income countries. It could be a conduit for money to support those labs so that um, the, it frees up the, the labor of the people in those regions to participate in PSA projects. But someone needs to make those grants and the money for the grants has to come from someone. Um, for democratic decision-making, um, one way to live up to that value is to have some sort of system in place and people who ensure that uh, the PSA's elections are fast and fair. Well, someone needs to do that. Um, to ensure transparency, um, it could ensure that um, uh, it, PSA data sets are curated well um, and that the methods are well documented alongside reproducible code. Well, someone needs to do that curation. 
someone needs to do that checking, someone needs to make the code reproducible, and someone needs to make sure that everything is accessible on an appropriate repository. Um, you get the point. For each of these values, there are specific activities that could ensure that the PSA lives up to the value, but someone needs to do those activities and the resources to ensure that someone does those things need to be made available somewhere. If the resources aren't available, that constrains the extent to which the PSA can actually live up to these values. Uh, there's perhaps a partially happy ending to all of this. So um, this happened uh, uh, earlier this year. Um, we, uh, the PSA got a notice that um, uh, it actually did achieve some funding. This is uh, project-based funding. Um, so it's in one of those categories that um, I outlined at the start of the talk. Um, and uh, that's at least good news. So someone thinks that the PSA is a good idea. We were able to work within the constraints of the funding landscape as it is. However, um, I'd say that uh, the PSA's problems with funding are not entirely solved for, uh, for example, for one thing, um, even though uh, the grant does pay for some stuff that's uh, slightly outside the remit of the projects that are funded, um, it's still quite hard to pay for stuff that doesn't have as, as strong of a case that it's related to the, this particular project. Um, another question is, well, this grant is time limited, so what happens when the grant expires? Um, it sort of seems like the PSA is tied to this endless cycle where it needs to put out applications, um, which is time consuming. Um, and uh, there's a, a risk uh, with each new application of uh, a big budget crunch and possible um, staffing shortage or other problem related to the expiry of a grant. This particular grant is tied to the Templeton Foundation strategic priorities. So, um, it means that the PSA is doing a big project to advance those uh, strategic priorities. Uh, people may reasonably disagree about um, whether those strategic priorities are good ones. The fact of the matter is that the PSA has tied itself to advancing the mission of one particular funder. And um, finally, the grant is administered by uh, Ashland University, um, which is not located in the Global South. So I showed that map of where PSA members are located. Um, this is not exactly doing much to help that problem um, because the PI for the grant is located at Ashland, it's Chris Chartier, um, and the administration of the grant is happening at Ashland as well. So that's the first case study. Um, what about the second? So as I mentioned, um, this is my current workplace, the Pissarra Center for Behavioral Economics. To give you a sense of uh, what this organization is, it's a nonprofit behavioral science center headquartered in Nairobi. Um, we do two kinds of projects. Um, there's, uh, there are research projects and more advisory projects. And I'll talk a little bit about what these are specifically in just a bit. Um, and um, uh, the projects are broadly focused on the theme of uh, poverty alleviation, especially in the Global South. We've done a lot of projects, um, more than 377 by my count, focused on the Global South. And uh, one of the thing, one organizational emphasis is uh, to build infrastructure for uh, behavioral science-led uh, or for Global Science, Global South-led <laughs> behavioral science. Um, so some of the projects are more on the advisory side of PSARA. I'd characterize these as uh, implementation focused. Um, to give you a sense of what these are, this is one of our past projects. Um, it was focused on uh, the theme of digital credit, uh, especially in Tanzania. And so uh, what we were doing was uh, analyzing the digital credit market and uh, providing a tool to uh, help uh, identify how loans can be dispersed. So the, the focus here was um, to try to expand digital credit 
to more people, um, especially those, those who need it, and to provide a tool for facilitating that expansion. Um, some of the projects, on the other hand, are a bit more research that was very much focused on you know, doing a specific activity, providing a specific tool with a specific goal in, in mind. Some are, are more focused on knowledge generation, but a lot of these are done at the behest of other people. Um, so here's an example. This is a, a paper that compares the impact of giving people direct transfers of cash um, to giving people psychotherapy on um, both uh, economic variables and uh, psychological variables, well-being. Um, this was a project led by uh, one of Gusara's founders. He's uh, an academic named Johannes Haushofer. Um, we do a, a lot of other research projects, but most of them are done for, for a specific PI. So the typical model might be someone says, hey, I, I want to do a project on yeah, cash transfers. Can you help us um, figure it out and, and help us do it? And we say, yeah. Um, and we've got a large research lab to facilitate this kind of partnership. Um, if the important thing to, to recognize here is that these are often done at the behest of an external PI. We do complete some research that just because we think it's important, um, I'd say that this is the minority. And in fact, um, my team in Pusara is focused on exactly that. Um, it's uh, me and, and um, three other employees. Um, and just for context, Nasara has maybe about 150 employees. So it's a pretty small team. We do some research just because we think it's important, but it's definitely the minority of our projects. Um, I, I would say that um, overall, across both the advisory projects that we're doing that are implementation focused and the research projects that we're doing, they're all, or the vast majority of them are done for a client. Um, I'm using uh, consulting language here because that's a reasonable way to understand it. Um, the client comes to us with a problem and we come up with a way to solve it. Um, so this is maybe in that third category of the funding landscape that, that I mentioned, where some uh, funding is project-oriented. That's a lot of what Pissarra is doing. Um, to give you a sense of why this is, um, here are some, uh, these are uh, success rates for different kinds of projects that we use for internal accounting. Um, a lot of science funding, so the project-oriented uh, funding or the funding for stellar PIs is in this um, first category, open competition. And um, the internal success rate that we use for you know, forecasting and um, to help guide our work is that uh, we have a 2% success rate with this kind of um, bid to use the uh, consulting language, 2%. Um, on the other hand, single source, which is more of the project that is done on behalf of clients who come to us, um, has a 15% success rate according to our internal accounting. This is a huge difference. So you can see, I, 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 it's not clear to me that these, are, these success rates are exactly accurate, um, but we have a strong economic incentive just in, in terms of like, our ability to, to, to turn, keep the lights on to develop these uh, single source bids um, where clients are coming to us uh, with a, a specific need and we fulfill that need. Uh, we can try to go for those open competitions, but it's hard and um, we expect to be successful a much lower percentage of the time for that kind of uh, bid. Many of those clients that I'm talking about are uh, in the global north. That's just where a lot of the funding is. Um, these are clients like the Gates Foundation, UNICEF, Templeton. Um, so we work with uh, Templeton just like the PSA does. Um, Innovations for Poverty Action and uh, even individual academics. Um, 
uh, a lot of these people and organizations are located in the global north. And um, each of these has their own funding priorities, uh, often that are set out in RFPs, but with individual academics, those funding priorities, the things that they want to get done, are the things that help uh, them uh, get scientific credits so that they can you know, continue having their jobs. Um, so I'd say that this sets up um, some boundaries, some barriers um, with the, the clients, the funders, um, the people who set the priorities on one side, and the people that who we're working with, who I hope are the beneficiaries of uh, the projects that we do on the other. Um, most of those uh, uh, funders are located in the global north. Uh, by definition, because of Musara's organizational remit, most of our beneficiaries are in the global south. And um, there are enormous divisions between these two sides. Um, they cut across culture, race, ethnicity, income, language. Uh, that means that, um, which means overall, that uh, the priorities uh, of the funders are just very different from the priorities of the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries. And this division between uh, funders and beneficiaries creates a large number of ethical risks. So one of them is uh, uh, neocolonialism, or that's at least what I'll call it. So beneficiaries, um, you know, sometimes we are just doing projects to benefit them, but often we are doing projects that we hope generate knowledge. And um, our, our beneficiaries do need to uh, put in some labor in order to get that research done. Um, because they're participants, they have to fill out questionnaires, they have to come to our Pissarro lab and so forth. So what ends up happening is that we um, end up generating a report that conveys some sort of knowledge. The knowledge goes to the funders because it's a deliverable. Um, it's how the funders know that we've done the work that we're contracted to do. But the knowledge is uh, often not relevant to or not accessible by the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries. Um, that can either be because of the language that it's written in, um, the, uh, the fact that it, the documents are technical, um, the fact that they're not accessible. Um, sometimes they're covered under NDA even. Um, there are a number of reasons why. Um, the fact of the matter is that the research outcomes, the, the knowledge are not communicated to the beneficiaries. So you, you end up with a system where a bunch of people often who are located in Africa are um, putting in labor to generate knowledge that goes to people in the global north and doesn't go back to the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries. Um, that sounds like a bit uncomfortably close to a colonial system. Another risk created by these barriers between funders and ultimate beneficiaries is what I'll term social harm. Um, this isn't direct harm, um, like actually happened during colonial days, um, but it's it's um, more social in nature, and it might take a little bit of explanation to understand the type of harm that I'm talking about. So I'm going to take uh, an example that actually happened from a randomized controlled trial to see whether giving people cash um, could help reduce some um, or increase the uptake of H HIV prevention behaviors that occurred in South Africa. This sounds like a great project. You know, you're giving people money. Um, these people are often quite poor. Um, and uh, the, uh, the hope is that giving people money will prevent the spread of HIV, which is a terrible disease. So the aims of this project are good. However, um, yeah, as it turns out, um, when people did qualitative interviews um, to kind of figure out people's experiences uh, uh, during this project, they found out that um, the cash transfers had created some, well, some things that look a lot like harms. It's just that they were social in nature. Uh, so for example, the people receiving these grants were women and girls. Um, and um, uh, 
people saw saw the cash transfer and thought like, well, I mean, why are why are they getting the money and not I? Like, what did they do to deserve getting this money? Plus, the the cash was uh, given by an organization that you know a lot of people didn't had never heard of before. It was just some foreign uh, organization with unknown goals, um, without a, a clear agenda that they had been explained to them, um, and uh, giving people money who it wasn't clear why that what they did to serve it, whether they did some work or like why why are people getting this money and I'm not. Um, so the result was that uh, a lot of people, particularly young men, started spreading rumors about the recipients of the cash transfers that they were HIV positive, prostitutes or pregnant, and that the study staff um, had uh, been trying to infect them with AIDS or teach them to be prostitutes. So a lot of this sounds pretty lurid. Um, I think this, it's more understandable when you take the perspective that nobody in this village um, or in these regions really knew exactly uh, what the aims of the, of the research were, who the organization was, um, anything about uh, the idea of a control group, or it, none of that had been clearly explained. So they filled in the gaps with explanations that made sense to them. Um, here's uh, another um, qualitative study, this time in Kenya. Um, it's also a cash transfer RCT. Um, and uh, here, the, some of the study participants or people in the control group um, concluded that uh, the reason for the, the, that some people were getting the money was that um, this was all a plot by the Illuminati who um, had um, I wanted to uh, lurid things with the people who were getting the money, and the money was actually a payment to um, get them to do those things. Um, obviously, it's this isn't what the organization was really trying to do. But again, remember, what's probably happening here is that uh, the study has not been sufficiently explained. Um, sometimes there's not even really an effort to um, get the outcomes of the, the research to people at all. Um, and people filled in the gaps with explanations that made sense to them. I'd say overall, um, these uh, examples of social harm are caused by barriers in understanding that are created by the enormous gap that exists between the people who are primarily shaping the priorities and the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries. And bridging that gap requires um, effort and work and uh, above all, clear communication. Another um, ethical pitfall of the funding landscape is um, an organizational problem for Pusara, and that is the issue of voice. So I mentioned how um, you know, these are the three categories of uh, uh, funding that, or fun, funding uh, initiatives that, that generally exist in science funding. And um, Busara is mostly doing this third style of funding, which is problem solving. Um, some of the specific projects as well. Um, when you think about it though, like especially that problem solving type of funding um, by definition is focused on the priorities of funders, not the priorities of the organizations that receive the funding. Those organizations are supposed to be problem solvers for the funders. This creates a problem for trying to do work like the work that my group is intended to do, which is work that Usara organizationally uh, finds important. Um, and this is like a, a pretty tough nut to crack. Um, even though it's supposed to be the, the topic of my group, I can't say that we've solved it completely. Um, we've tended to go for uh, funding opportunities in these first two categories, excellent PIs and um, specific projects. But I mentioned um, the success rate for those is quite low. So we're caught in a place where we're trying to generate money to do work that we find important. Um, that means that we're trying not to go for the problem solving types of uh, uh, funding opportunities, but it takes a ton of work to um, overcome that 2% success rate for open competitions. Uh, and uh, there's a risk that we spend more time 
doing the work writing the grants than we do actually doing the work. Okay, um, so what can we conclude from all of this? First, uh, I've argued that our funding system is optimized for funders who want primarily projects, star PIs, and a little bit of uh, problem solving you know, on the topics that they find uh, important to them. This um, funding system creates uh, waste because uh, it encourages people like those in my position to spend tons of time um, uh, trying to fit uh, what they want to do within the constraints that the funding system has, has created. Um, it also creates ethical risks in the form of, um, you know, only permitting certain people to do research, mostly people in the global north, um, and in the form of barriers that exist between people who um, are supposed to be the beneficiary of the funding and the people who are actually creating the RFPs. Um, and most importantly to uh, this, uh, this particular symposium, um, the system is also quite ina inequitable. The people who are able to apply for these, uh, this, these kinds of funding tend to be focused in the global north, which uh, creates this, perpetuates the system of inequality that produces huge skews in the kind of research that gets done and the priorities that that research investigates. The funding system also discourages um, different ways of doing science. And by this, I mean organizations that are somewhat outside of the typical mold of a typical university. Organizations like the Pusara Center, where I currently work, or like the PSA. And it also makes hard for people in general, especially people who are located in these different kinds of institutions, um, to exercise their own voice to work on things that are their priorities. What do we do about this? I have to admit, you know, this section is a bit um, less fleshed out than the previous ones because this is a complicated problem and it's fundamentally institutional and shaped by, you know, colonial history, uh, to be frank. So I don't have a one size fits all solution. I just have a couple recommendations or general thoughts that kind of flow from the problems that I've identified. The first is, um, it's just good for people to know that organizations that wanna work on problems of like how to make psychology or science in general truly global, more representative of um, the global South in particular, um, organizations that prioritize that already exist. Um, there are organizations like the PSA and like the Basara Center. The problem is that those organizations face the con constraints that are pretty difficult and that are imposed by the current system of funding. Um, to help those organizations and build more organizations um, like the PSA and like the Busara Center, um, I think funders should explicitly fund capacity building activities. Um, so what this means is rather than focusing on specific projects or focusing on problem solving or focusing on star PIs, um, the funding ecosystem uh, or funders should try to create an ecosystem that promotes the projects that they want to see. Um, so rather than imposing a set of values on people or saying, hey, you know, create this project and then do it, um, they should be trying to build capacity in the places where um, the capacity is less strong and creating a holistic ecosystem that can then lead to the generation of projects that um, uh, hopefully fit with the priorities of the people who live in the, that ecosystem. Insofar as funding needs to be project-based, you know, even if we uh, create more capacity building funding, um, the system is not going to change overnight, but insofar as uh, funding is project-based, um, that funding should allow for more generous overheads. You know, overheads are those things that are often they're 
uh, shrunk because the funder wants uh, low overheads. You know, maybe they limit their overhead rate to 10% or 15%. Um, that's just not going to keep the lights on for an organization like the PSA or like the Pusara Center. These organizations exist because of overheads. That is what makes um, you know, organizations like them possible. So uh, I would argue that um, to allow for capacity strengthening, um, project-based funding should not be limiting, limiting overhead so severely. Finally, um, funders in general should move away from competitive grant schemes. Those are the schemes that are, that are those open competitions that Pusara pegs at a 2% success rate um, in our current accounting. Um, that success rate is, um, even though it might be a little bit conservative, it's not that conservative if you look, look at the success rate at places like the National Institutes of Health or the European Research Council. I think um, one, of the, uh, one of the mechanisms that I applied for um, when I was working for the PSA, um, the uh, synergy mechanism had uh, about a 10% success rate recently, um, or it might have been even lower. I mean, this is just what you're dealing with when you're working with competitive grant schemes. And that kind of success rate, that kind of funding structure, actually, it's not even just limited to the success rate. That funding structure is enormously inefficient. It encourages people like me who are trying to fund organizations like the PSA and like um, the Pusara Center to spend most of their time working on funding and generating funding rather than actually doing the research and uh, projects that I think everybody wants to see. Um, and I think the, the answer here is, uh, well, hopefully, you know, give more generously to the mechanisms that exist, but really it's to do away from that funding structure enti entirely um, to maybe work on um, or uh, create things like funding lotteries uh, where above a certain cut point of quality, everybody has an equal chance to uh, receive some funding. Um, or it involves developing relationships, trusted relationships with organizations that a funder happens to like so that they can understand the needs of the organization, the constraints that they're operating under, and be a champion for that organization. I think this is a, a, a quite important topic, um, but insofar as uh, uh, a lack of representation in science is tied to funding. It's also a tough one. And I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I think a big part of tackling this problem is trying out new structures and um, uh, just uh, working on the, uh, the problem a bit at a time uh, and incrementally the, the improving the system that we have. And I hope I've convinced you that this is a worthwhile thing to do. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Miguel Silan and I'll be giving my thoughts on increasing representation in big team science. Much of my stance in this talk comes from thinking about these issues as an assistant director in the Psychological Science Accelerator. And as Patrick have introduced, the PSA is a globally distributed network of researchers which aim to accelerate the accumulation of psychological knowledge that is reliable and generalizable to a broader spectrum of humanity. But also, I am the inviting editor for the APS Observer for a new series called Global Spotlight, which aimed to, well, spotlight how psychology is being done across the world, especially developing regions, both the challenges and the fruitful and unique approaches of how it's being done. The PSA, if you're not familiar, do multi-country and even global studies across a range of topics, including facial perception, morality, cognition, and so on. Recently, we've also launched behavioral studies regarding COVID and COVID prevention, which really is global in reach, having gathered data from at least 87 countries across the world. 
However, when we look at the map of the PSA, we immediately see a challenge. The vision of a truly generalizable psychology also, of course, needs a truly representative psychology. And the goal really is to greenify this PSA map. This is a top goal. To understand more of this challenge, we need to know how the PSA recruits its members. From the very beginning, one of the main ways that the PSA recruits is through a word of mouth, especially on social media, particularly on Twitter. In fact, the very first inception of the PSA was born out of a Twitter post by Chris Chardier, and it just snowballed from there. Word of mouth regarding specific projects also help in the expansion of the network. For example, we were around 1,400 researchers during the start of the pandemic, and we grew to around 2,000 after the launch of the behavioral COVID studies. Of course, many of our members also give talks specifically introducing the PSA, uh, it, and maybe part of a larger open science initiative or methods talks that they give. Internally as well, uh, the PSA has done a systematic purposive recruitment from the developing world. This was headed by the Community Building and Network Expansion Committee. This recruitment drive was headed by Aishwara Ayer, with the committee members including Bastian, Nadia, Ade, Savannah, Natalia, Peter, and we are now currently joined by Jacob, Hassan, and Chris as well. So we made a database of psychology researchers from top universities in developing countries and sent them a cold email exploring potential interest in the PSA, highlighting the benefits and opportunities uh, by joining the network. Uh, we did this in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, Middle East, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands and Eastern Europe. And we did manage to recruit in this manner, but the engagement rate wasn't really that high. It was in the single digit percentage per region, which is not nothing. Every single voice from the developing world incorporated into the network is, I believe, something to be proud of. But of course, we still want a truly representative psychological science. Those of us from the third world countries know why the low engagement rate uh, is for the developing world. I think this will be echoed in so many talks in this conference, so I will not belabor each point, but we know, for example, how challenging the research capacity is given our lack of funds, given the lack of infrastructure and resources. And when pursuing a research project, we face logistical uh, difficulties such as even basic internet issues, illiteracy in vulnerable popular uh, participants that we study, political instability, and so on. We also face the even just research culture hur hurdles. For example, psychology might not even be seen as an empirical discipline in many developing countries. So research is already hard without even putting into account big team science research. But I believe a big part of the hesitation as well in joining big team science projects is really the question of, What's in it for me? If I join this project, does it even count for my career advancement? Does it even speak to culturally relevant topics? Does it address local problems? Will I just be a glorified data gatherer instead of a decision maker? And so on and so forth. So the more that I work on these issues, the clearer it becomes on how to actually frame it generatively. Instead of asking, how do we recruit scientists from the developing world into the network? A more generative framework is really to ask, how do we make big team science work for those in developing nations? So how do we do this? I believe one of the biggest things that we can advance here is to just straight, go straight into what matters. I believe our big team science projects should really pursue research that make our limited research resources worth it. And for those of us in the developing world, this means a focus on shared national urgent issues. And we have a lot. Poverty, hunger, political instability, 
basic health, basic education, and so on. So we would want to develop special collaborative projects, whether developing nations within a region, for example, in Latin America, or developing nations across the world, which again, focus on these shared national urgent issues. Because one, what's, what's in it for them? Why the whole lot? And two, even though there really are, you know, real research, logistical, cultural, and political hurdles, the incentive to do these kinds of projects would be still very high. This also means forming closer ties to nonprofit and the development sector, especially as potential funding partners, as these potential research projects are both psychologically informative, psychologically rich, and also, of course, socially beneficial. Another way to make big team science work for those in developing nations is to promote culturally sensitive and culturally specific research. Culturally sensitive methods, for example, include indigenous, qualitative, and ethnographic methods, which sometimes are the most viable ways to do research, especially in the context of low SES and vulnerable populations. And this includes possibly adopting a cross indigenous rather than a cross cultural approach. If you want to learn more about this, uh, you can follow this QR code. Field experiments that have relevant practical outcomes, such as those in applied behavioral science work, such as vaccine intake or energy consumption, are also promising, as well as lab in the field and field in the lab designs. Again, the QR link discusses some of these issues more. We also want to promote culturally specific research topics. For example, Puya Razavi just recently published a paper on Gerat, a moral emotional experience ubiquitous in Muslim Middle Eastern cultures, but is not widely known outside of it. Another example might be the concept of shared humanity, which is Kapwa in the Philippines or Ubuntu in Pan-African countries, which really is a sort of particular social cognition which affects social and relational maintenance behaviors. So there's a whole lot of these shared cultural, social, and psychological phenomena that exist in the developing world that may not be given the spotlight in mainstream Western psychology. Another way to make big team science work for those in the developing nations is to just embed researchers in platforms of collaborations. By joining a long-standing network like the PSA, this allows for repeated interactions, for the accumulation of social capital, for easy platform of communications, and accessible sharing of expertise, all of which are fertile conditions for productive research collaborations. In fact, this conference was born out of interactions made within the PSA platforms. So for those who haven't already, come join us in the PSA. And more importantly, join our regional hubs, Africa, Latin America, Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and North America. Our goal here really is to build stronger regional collaboration among researchers. And a way to make big team science work for those in developing nations as well is really just to make it easier to do big team science in the first place through funding and resources. However, as we heard from Patrick, this is a horribly difficult thing to do. For there to be proper resources, maybe even proper compensation to help those in the developing world to engage in big team science, we need funds. Of course, there are multiple ways to do this, funding drives, grant writing, partnerships, faith services, etc. And but you know, for so many things of the for so many things that we want, it would be so much easier to do if there was money. There is no money. We need to make it. So join us in the funding and finance committee, and let's make many of our dreams come true. Think about how much easier it is to do translation and data gathering and research support um, for those of us in the developing nations if the PSA were to become financially sustainable. At the PSA, we have the potential to do really boundary pushing big team science. 
And a big push of this would come from those of us in the developing world. There are many, many challenges, and we know them by heart. But I think this talk is, more than anything, a call to arms for a special project, a large-scale collaboration made by and made for developing researchers that goes straight into what matters to us. Otherwise, we would need to have stronger regional collaborations that focus on culture-specific and culture-sensitive methods. And that begins by congregating ourselves in long-standing networks like the PSA and like its recently launched regional hubs and to really make big team science easier to do by securing funding. An old mentor used to say, and I think I have this tattooed in my bones, we create the things that we wish existed. And if any of this uh, in my talk inspire you to have a project proposal, a collaboration, a half-baked idea that may go somewhere, let's talk about it. And I can't wait to see you in the question and answer portion. See you there.